Someone give me a thumbs up. Yep. Okay, how do we get rid of that? Okay, so hi everyone um, in the room and online. Welcome to our presentation today on common mistakes in statistics and how to avoid them. Brad and I are really excited to be presenting this because we're hoping it's going to save us some work if we can tell you things that, that we commonly see, mistakes that people commonly make and how you can avoid those in your work. So um, we'll start with an acknowledgement to country. So on the lands that we study, we walk and we live we acknowledge and respect the traditional custodians and cultural knowledge holders of these lands. So just a really quick introduction for those of you who haven't met us before. My name's Marika Badaham. I'm the Director of Statistical Consulting here at UOW. I'm really passionate about data literacy and inspiring people to love statistics and use them in their research and their everyday lives. I'm also really keen on reducing statistics anxiety, particularly in our students. And in my research life, I'm interested in um, lifestyle interventions for chronic diseases. And I'll hand over to Brad. Yes, I'm Dr. Brad Wakefield. I'm a statistical consultant in the SATS Consulting Centre. Uh, my job is essentially to help people who need uh, SATS advice. They can come see me and I'll give advice. Um, my background is in mathematical statistics. Um, I love maths, I love statistics, and I love it when they apply to the real world. Uh, I'm a programmer, love programming as well, and I like applying data science methods in innovative ways. I care about people applications of data science, and that includes, you know, doing things correctly and properly, and that also stems from my background in data privacy, which is what my PhD was in. Um, I enjoy learning and collaborating with people from all sorts of disciplines. Um, everyone knows that I like to chat quite a lot. Most of my meetings run late because I end up talking too much. Um, but yeah, so I'm interested. I'm excited to give this talk. And, and I'll be reining Brad in during this talk yes, if yeah. he gets carried away. <laughs> okay, so we've decided to focus on nine really common mistakes that we see people make. There are obviously a lot more than these um, and some of the papers that um, I'll refer you to talk about a lot more mistakes, but we wanted to rein it into some really common ones that we think can be uh, addressed fairly easily. So these are the ones that we're going to go through. So the first one is a really basic one, but this is one that we often see people get wrong and it's still a real issue in publications. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes talking about the basics because it's really important that we understand these before we go on and talk about some of the more complicated uh, problems that people get themselves into. So just to remember that we've got two types of variables that we can be looking at when we're analyzing data and they both have subtypes. So I'll talk a little bit more about these two. So first of all, we have our quantitative variables and they can be divided into discrete and continuous. And I've written some examples there. So the important things about discrete variables is that they're integers and continuous variables can be um, recorded on an infinite scale uh, to an infinite number of decimal places theoretically. So there are additional classifications about interval and ratio data, which I won't be talking about. The categorical variables are the ones that appear to be the most problematic in terms of analysis. Um, we've got two types of those as well. So we've got nominal or unordered categorical variables, and we have ordinal categorical variables, and they can both be treated different ways in analysis. So just to look at categorical data a bit more, because it does tend to be one that people have issues with uh, more often, 
So when we have a categorical variable, we usually code it numerically in our data set. That makes it a lot easier to analyze. And one of the most common mistakes that people do make in their coding is say, for example, we have location where we have urban, regional, and rural, all with capital letters. If we were coding that as words and we had urban with a capital U and urban with a lowercase u, your software package would detect that as being two separate categories. So if we start by coding that numerically, we can avoid those mistakes to begin with. Sometimes we might have a more qualitative data question in our analysis and we want to analyze it. If it's a fairly straightforward qualitative one, like the example that we have here in terms of symptoms, we can turn that into a type of categorical and then we can use that for analysis as well. If your data is really in a qualitative format, then there are other qualitative methods that you might need to use it and they're things that we're not going to be considering in this presentation. So if we have categorical data, we need to describe it in terms of frequencies, percentages and proportions. That's the way it's described and that's the way it's analysed. When it comes to presenting categorical data, it should be presented in something like a bar chart. And the bar chart could be of the counts or of the percentages as is shown here. So what do we do when we're analysing categorical data? We use frequency tables. And if we've got more than one categorical variable, we'd use a contingency table or a cross tabulation. We calculate proportions or percentages for that data. We can compare differences in other variables across groups. Say, for example, we wanted to look at the differences in age between different um, groups, regional, urban, and um, rural, for example, we could do that. When we're analyzing a categorical variable as a dependent variable, we would need to use logistic, ordinal, or multinomial regression. If, we're, if we have um, a number of predictors, or we could be using cross tabulations and chi-squares, for example, as well. We need to use bar charts, as I've said, to describe it, or we could be using box plots if we've got categories of continuous variables, and I'll show you some pictures of that as we go along. And we need to make sure that we're treating it as a categorical variable in the analysis. So if you're using a package like SPSS, for example, when you go into that package, you would set up your data type as being um, nominal in SPSS so that it knows that it's a categorical variable. And you need to do a similar thing if you're using R, for example, you need to tell R what sort of variable you have. So what you don't do with categorical variables is treat them like a quantitative variable. So here, for example, with this education data, we have coded that education data with labels from one to five. But those labels, the numbers themselves are meaningless. We would not be um, calculating a mean and a standard deviation of those numbers because it's a categorical variable. But it is a common mistake that people did do do that. We wouldn't be doing correlations on categorical data unless it's ordinal. And even then with an ordinal variable, it needs to have a fairly large number of levels to get a decent correlation. So if you've only got three levels, you're not going to get a very good correlation with, an ordinal, da with ordinal data. We don't use it in linear regression as a dependent variable. And we don't visualize it with scatter plots or other quantitative variable methods or treat it as a quantitative variable in the analysis. So there's some, that's just a quick run through of issues with, or common issues with categorical data. There is a fairly common issue with quantitative data as well. And it has a lot to do with skewed data, which a lot of people are working with. Um, if data is normally distributed, then it's really easy to describe it using a mean and a standard deviation or a mean and a confidence interval. But if you have data that's skewed, you shouldn't be using a mean and a standard deviation or a confidence interval to describe it. You should be using the median and the interquartile range. So here are two classic variables that are right skewed. 
So length of stay in hospital is a good example. That's um, right skewed. It's also often bounded by zero. So a lot of people who go into hospital are just in for day stay. So they're staying less than a day. So they're staying zero days. It's recorded as that. And then you would have the minimum and you can often have the whole of Q1 being zero because you have a lot of people. So you've got at least 25% of the sample in this case being uh, zero days. So if, this, if your data is skewed, the mean doesn't represent the centre of the spread. And when that becomes important is if you were the um, administrator of the hospital, the CEO of the hospital, and you're using a mean, you're getting a mean stay in the hospital of 3.67 days. Well, that could have really big implications on your budget. If actually the median stay is only two days, then it makes a big difference about some of the decisions you might want to make in planning for that hospital. So these things can have real consequences in the real world. And so you need to be careful about how you're describing the data. So if you're concerned or you're not really sure what to do, often you can present both. So this is, a, this is quite an old paper now, but I love using this one in teaching. It's about an experiment that was done in some psychology students, of course, that's what they always seem to do experiments on at university. And what they were doing was looking at the amount of time the students thought about food, sleep and sex. So how, how much time or how many times they estimated in a day they would think about those things. And then they gave them a clicker and they had to record how many times a day they actually thought about those things. So why I present this one is because you can see that in the paper, they've described the data as both um, a median and a range. So they've treated it as skewed there, and they've also done it as a mean and a standard deviation. And you can see that the means are really quite different from the medians, so it's reflecting the data is really skewed, right skewed. Um, but that, that's a good way of actually describing this data and showing the variation in the data without using actual plots. It probably would have been actually better to do some histograms with this, but this is a nice way of doing it if you're concerned about how to present your data. So some other take home messages is about how you should be displaying data. So if you're using bar charts, they should only be used for categorical data. So as you're placing it on the left there, there is a, um, a visualization here of the proportion of patients in a control and intervention group who have lost greater than or equal to 5% of their body weight or less than 5% of their body weight after a, a, um, a trial, a weight loss trial. And there are confidence intervals as well. And because that's categorical data, it's divided into one of two categories or, and between two groups, it's appropriate to display that in a bar chart. Here we have a bar chart of the mean weight loss in the control and the intervention group, or the mean weights pre and post, sorry. And this should not be described as a bar chart with confidence intervals because it is continuous data. If you want to display continuous data, it should be done either as a confidence interval plot, as shown here, or as side-by-side -side box and whisker plots, as shown here. So they're just really simple, um, simple messages to get across. And it's routinely done, particularly in health and biological sciences, that people mistakenly use uh, figures like this one, where they're presenting continuous data as bar charts. Okay, so over to Brad for number two. Yeah, cool. So uh, I will warn you, this section is a little bit statsy technically. But uh, hopefully it won't be too bad um, and just bear with me and I'll try and make it interesting. We'll see. We'll see how people feel about that. All right. So, uh, well, I should say what, what the, the mistake here is. Mistake, misunderstanding, hypothesis testing, p-values and significance, right? These are all key terms we use all the time in statistics. And often they have a very semantic definition that we statisticians roll out. Um, and, but then they're used somewhat incorrectly uh, throughout literature because, you know, they, significant seems like a general colloquial word we can use just, you know, as we want, when it actually means something very, very specific in statistics. 
Uh, but before we get into that, I just want to kind of take us back a step and think about what we're actually trying to do when we're doing hypothesis testing. Um, we put it under the class of inferential statistics, and it's essentially what we are trying to do is make, based on a, a small sample of a data from a, a broader population, we're going to try and make inference. We're going to try and say something about a broader population based on a small subset of the data of, of that population. And the way we do it is with what's called a random sample. Um, and a random sample is essentially, we assume we independently pick people, we produce a little representative subsample, and then we say, based on the mean of that subsample, we get a pretty good estimate of the broader population. And underpinning all this, underpinning all this is some results in probability theory. And I'm, you know, I could, I could bore you about this. Um, but there is this one result called central limit theorem, which basically says means tend towards a normal distribution. That's why everyone is all obsessed with normal distributions all the time. It's because a very interesting result, regardless of what the distribution looks like originally, the sample mean will end up kind of looking like a normal distribution if we were to pull it out multiple times. So if we were to get, you know, run the experiment 10 times and then plot the sample mean each time, it'll end up looking like a normal distribution. And so we don't actually need to know the distribution of the data sometimes, sometimes we do, um, in order to make valid inference on that, on that broader population, which I think is really cool. All right, so um, just a, a few terminology things. We kind of class values into two categories, right? We have our population parameters and you know, we can use the term mean interchangeably, and that's often confusing for people. But we can talk about the population mean, which is kind of like the true mean. That's the thing. If I was to survey every single person in my population, work out what the actual average is, that's that new. We never really know that new, unless we, you know, are the ABS and doing a census, we don't really know that new. What we usually get is what's called a sample mean, and that's based on a small subset of that broader population. Okay, and so what we try and do, so we try to use the sample mean, which is a statistic, in order to estimate the population mean. Okay, so you might have seen this a lot of the times when people write down null hypotheses, and they've got a mu, that's that little u looking thing, that represents the true unknown mean, and then we've got this x bar, which represents our estimated sample mean, okay, but essentially Two different quantities, they both, we call them mean, but one is the population mean, one is the sample mean, and we're going to use the sample mean to try and approximate the population mean, okay? And that applies broadly to other statistics, not just mean, um, standard deviation, we might have a sample standard deviation, and then we have a population standard deviation. And you'll usually see notation like S for the sample standard deviation and sigma, which is the little circle with a line on top for the population standard deviation, okay? Make sense? But two, two separate concepts. Um, one is an estimate of that, and we're trying to you know, use this in order to learn about this. All right, so what is, what is hypothesis testing? Um, I've given a definition here, um, and it, you can tell it's a semantic definition, right? Hypothesis testing is a statistical analysis used to determine if there is sufficient evidence to reject a specific statement about a population parameter. All right, so we're going to make a statement about this unknown quantity and we're going to use sample data to work out whether or not there is sufficient statistical evidence to reject it. So again, based on my sample data, can I reasonably be sure that my mean for the entire population is, for example, not equal to 10? Okay, now that seems hyper-specific. We can make that statement more useful than just checking whether or not our mean is equal to 10. In fact, we often have it equal to, not equal to zero. I think the important point here is that we're not proving things. I'm not proving that my mean is 10 or my mean isn't 10. It still could be. We're just saying that we have sufficient evidence to say it's probably not, right? Or it's likely not. Um, and at the conclusion of a hypothesis test, we either conclude that we have sufficient evidence to reject a, a hypothesis. So based on my sample, based on how I understand probability to work, I don't think this reasonably will be this null hypothesis, I'm gonna reject it, or I can say that I don't have sufficient evidence to reject it. I'm not saying that therefore it is true, 
okay? So not rejecting a hypothesis is not the same as uh, essentially saying that hypothesis is now true. Okay, that's, a, that's an important statement to make. Okay, so how do we actually do a hypothesis test? What is the logic behind it? It's kind of a backwards logic. Everything in stats is kind of a backwards logic, but it's a nice logic when you, when you think about it. We always begin every hypothesis test with two hypotheses, with two statements. We have what's called the null hypothesis, and we have what, uh, some kind of alternative hypothesis. This is kind of a, a very standard way of framing the problem. We can say we're going to uh, test whether or not our mean is equal to 10, our population mean is equal to 10, against it's not equal to 10. Right? That's the alternative to that. And the first thing we do in a, in a, a hypothesis test is we actually assume that the null hypothesis is true. So we assume that the population mean is really 10. Right? We're going to pretend, at least for this moment, that the population mean is really 10. We then compute a, a test statistic. And this is essentially a formula that we've, you know, probability theory people have derived. And under the assumption that my mean really is 10, I will know how that test statistic should vary. Right? So I know kind of what the odds of getting a particular value or more extreme than that value is of that test statistic. And that's based on, like I said, that probability theory stuff, it all comes from there. So essentially, if I know what the true mean is, I can work out that probability distribution. So that's why we assume the null hypothesis to be true. And so given that the null hypothesis and the assumptions of the test, because some every test has additional assumptions, um, we can work out the probability distribution. So assuming that the true mean is really 10, we know what the chances of getting values of t are essentially, right? At this point, we've just assumed it. Then what we do is we kind of look at this curve and you can kind of think of this curve as if I was to compute T over and over and over and over again. And this is the histogram that results, right? So if I really had um, my population mean 10, I took a sample of you know, 100 people and I computed the test statistic on that 100 people, and then I did that multiple, multiple times and plotted a histogram of those test statistics. This is the kind of plot I would expect to resolve. Okay. Um, and essentially we have this middle section, this blue section, which is where most of the data is gonna fall. Most of the time the test statistic should fall in that region, right? We also have these extremes. So every now and then, every now and then, my test statistic, even if the null hypothesis, even if the population mean really is 10, is going to be something very extreme. Maybe I survey only billionaires or something and I was modeling income, right? Um, it can happen. It's unlikely to happen. And that's why it happens in the extremes. And what we do is we set a specific level, what we call our significance level, and we say, Anything that had more extreme probability than this significance level is going to be something that's kind of, it's an extreme value. It's unlikely to have occurred, right? So the significance level we tend to always use is 5%. Anytime my test statistic falls out into that, uh, that extreme region of the distribution, I'm going to say that's an extreme value. I was kind of unlikely to see something like that or something worse than that. Yeah. All right. So we see a reserved value. Our test statistic of 2.65 falls out in that region. Well, we then say, okay, well, it was quite an extreme result. So is it more likely or kind of do we think that's more likely that I got just an extreme result or maybe there's a problem with the assumption I made? Maybe there's a problem with the assumption I made. What assumption did I make? I assume that the mean is equal to, the true population mean is equal to 10, okay? So we say if we get an extreme value, it's probably because we made a bad assumption at the start, and so we reject that assumption. Kind of make sense? It's kind of like, let's pretend, for instance, that this is actually true. Well, let's take this to the logical conclusion and work out it's pretty extreme. It's kind of like a straw man argument in debating, you know? Take someone's point, take it to its logical extreme. 
right? And so that's why we use the phrase evidence suggests our null hypothesis is not true, or we will say we reject the null hypothesis. Yeah. What are p-values? Okay. Every time we do t-tests or every time we do any kind of hypothesis testing, we're always dealing with p-values. We're not talking about rejection regions or, well, not since you're, you know, stats course. Well, p-values are a really nice analog, a really nice way of performing hypothesis testing. It's a value that we can look at in order to conclude whether or not our test statistic would fall within a rejection region based on any significance level we pick. And it's a pretty simple idea. What a p-value is, is it's the probability under the null hypothesis of achieving the statistical value at least as extreme as the result you actually observed. Okay, and I'll say that again, at least as extreme. So it, it could be more extreme, but at least as extreme. And we always put this, well, when we have an alternative hypothesis, we consider both extremes, both the positive extreme and the negative extreme, okay? Um, and so if I worked out what that probability is, and it's essentially just adding all the, the, the bars here, calculating the area, working out how many cases would fall out in that extreme, we would expect, that is our p-value. A lot of people think p-value is the probability of our null hypothesis being true. It is not. It is absolutely not. It is the probability under the null hypothesis hypothesis of achieving statistic values at least as extreme as what we observed. So don't say it's the probability our null hypothesis is true because that doesn't make sense because the p-value is based on the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. Okay? All right. Now, think about it this way. We worked out a p-value and that was that colored area more extreme than, than this. My total area is going to be less than that of the p-value, which is marked by this orange value, yeah? And so as that p-value gets larger and larger and larger, once it overtakes 0 0.05, then I know it's going to fall into my retention region. So if you think about it that way, if my p-value is getting larger, then my test statistic has to be moving closer towards zero, yeah? And that means that it's going to eventually fall into the retention region. And the point at which it falls into the retention region is when my test statistics p-value passes 0.05, okay? So what does that mean practically? When my statistical software spits out a p-value, all I have to do is check whether or not that p-value is less than or equal to my significance level, which we always pick as 5%. Right? So all I have to do is look at my p-value and go, is that less than 5%? If it is less than 5%, then I know that this value has to be in the extremes because there's not enough space for it to have enough probability to fall into the retention region. And so I can reject the null hypothesis. If it's larger than 0 0.05, then I know that um, it falls into the retention region. Yeah. yeah? So we can do all of that logic with just checking whether or not one value is less than 0 0.05. That's pretty cool. It's pretty easy, all right? But there's a lot of buried logic that goes into that. And I think understanding that logic is going to really help explain your results better. Thank you, Dr. So significance, what does significant mean? In statistics, significant means significant with respect to a hypothesis test and significance level. And we describe a result as significant if it resulted in rejecting a null hypothesis, okay? So if you use the term significance in a paper or significant in a paper, you're not using it colloquially. You're saying, I've done a test. I've got a p-value associated with that test and I rejected the null hypothesis, right? If you use it uh, you know, differently, then uh, that's bad stats. People will get confused. They'll go, where's your, where's your p-value? Um, you can still describe differences between results, but use words like notable, right? That's a notable trend. That's a considerable difference. It doesn't, it's not significant. Significant means I've done a test, I've got a PO. All right. Um, and the other thing that is important to recognize about statistically significant is that it's more of a measure of how sure we are that our null hypothesis isn't true. It's not a measure of how big the difference is. It's just how sure we are it's true. 
The big difference is what we call an effect size. Okay, it's a different thing. Um, and a significant, uh, and, and I'll, I'll use a, an example here, right? I've got two examples. I've got a hundred observations from two different variables. Just think of it as two columns, okay? One of the columns, my average is 200, but it's really, really spread out. And in my other column, the average is 300, but it's really, really spread out. And my difference in sample means between these two columns is 63 in the first column and 205 in the second column. All right, now the difference between 63 and 205 is really big, right? That's a, that's a big difference in terms of just numbers. I've got another example in which I've got an average of 1.96 in my first column and 2.4 in my second column, okay? But it's all relative to the amount of spread. And if I was to plot this as a confidence interval, you can see that my first, my first example, the spread is really, really wide. So they're overlapping. Even though if you look at that scale, that's on a scale of minus 100 to 400. And this guy is on a scale from what 1.8 to 2.6. So it's a much smaller scale, but they are much more distinct because there's less spread. Okay. So significance is very much with respect to the variation and number of observations in the sample. How sure we are. It's not just a measure of the size difference um, in the sample means. I've had a few people ask me, but Brad, it's, it's a difference of three points. That's meaningful, right? That's meaningful. And I say, well, it's not statistically significant, even if that might be meaningful, because we've got so much spread or we don't have enough data to be sure that that truly is the difference between those means. Yeah. Now, while we're on the subject, what is a confidence interval? Again, confidence intervals like p-values are often misquoted or misstated. Um, and this is kind of a technical explanation of confidence interval, but a 95% confidence interval for a parameter is an interval based on the sample statistics that if we were to repeatedly compute for different random samples, so if I was to run the experiment multiple times and compute the interval each time, would contain the true parameter 95% of the time, okay? So if I did a sample, if I did an experiment, I got a sample, I computed the interval, and I did it again, and I did it again, I did it 100 times, we would expect 95 times it would actually contain the true parameter I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, when we talk about confidence interval, we do not talk about the, 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 the true parameter being random. We don't talk about the probability of the true parameter being within the interval, okay? Because the true parameter isn't, a, isn't something that's variable. It's not something to change, at least not in frequentist statistics, which is the kind of statistics we tend to use. So computing the probabilities of the true value being values, being any value, does not make sense. Doesn't make sense. And we do not say that there is a 95% probability your true value is in the confidence interval because that's not true, because it doesn't make sense, because there's no probability associated with the true value. What we do say is that you are 95% confident that your interval contains your true parameter. I know it seems like a semantic difference, as it always is in stats, but it, there's a difference between your interval being the random thing, the thing that changes each time, and your parameter being the random thing that changes each time. Yeah, okay, so confidence intervals give a sense of the uncertainty in the estimate. And so we tend to use them quite a lot because it gives it in the scale of the data. And some statisticians and journals prefer confidence intervals over p-values. And you can check your journals. They will tell you what the guides are on their statistical reporting. CIs are often very useful. I tend to favor reporting CIs and p-values. I think it's important to uh, report both. But yeah, look at your journals. They will, they will tell you what to do. All right. I'm going to quickly explain degrees of freedom because this is a term that gets thrown around all the time and I don't think it's well understood. The degrees of freedom of a statistical analysis are the maximum number of logically independent values, which are values that have the freedom to uh, vary in the data set. So degrees of freedom can be thought as the number of independent pieces of information used to obtain an, an estimate. Right? How many pieces of information have been put together in order to uh, produce this estimate? 
And if you were to consider the sample variance, all right, well, here I've got, uh, and you might not read mathematical formula, but essentially we're adding n, you know, adding together the squared differences of all the observations. So you might think, oh, there's n degrees of freedom. But we have one extra parameter in there, which is that x bar thing, the one, the x per one on the top, which is the sample mean, which means I would have had to use up some of my information in order to estimate that. Okay? At least one bit of information. And so the degrees of freedom associated with the sample variance is n minus one, right? Because although I'm adding in n different observations or however many observations I have in my sample, I need to use at least one bit of information in order to get my sample mean. Make sense? All right, cool. That was my rundown on hypothesis testing. Um, I hope it gets a little bit less statistical intensive from here on, but I think if you've got a good understanding of that, you'll understand how to kind of phrase your analysis, how to phrase your inference, and make sure you don't end up making statements that aren't actually true. Okay, third mistake that I see a lot of the times not checking assumptions. Um, now, I always say, I think everyone who's met with me would have heard me say it wouldn't be statistics without assumptions. We always do. We always have assumptions for our statistical tests. And every test has an assumption. Even the non-parametric tests, which people think don't have assumptions, still have assumptions. They're just usually met in a, in a, based on the study design. And essentially, what assumptions do is they breach that gap between the sample and the population. It allows us to apply those probability results, you know, that nice central limit theorem and all that kind of thing. There are certain assumptions that need to apply in order for us to be able to infer to our, to our population. If you don't meet those assumptions, it breaks that ability to infer to the population. So that's why assumptions are really important. Now, we often talk about parametric assumptions, non-parametric tests, that kind of thing. A parametric assumption just refers to any assumption that parameterizes a distribution or it puts a restriction on the distribution um, used in the test. And so parametric tests, of course, require parametric assumptions, usually about what distribution the data is or what distribution some results from the data is. But a parametric assumption is a restriction on the distribution. Non-parametric tests still have assumptions and it's usually around the independence between values. Right? If I asked you 100 times, that's not the same as asking 100 different people. Yeah? We still need that assumption to be met that we have independence between observations, even when we're talking about non-parametric tests. We just have less restrictions on what distributions could go into it. All right. So always, always, always check the specific assumptions of your analysis. Results may be invalid when assumptions are met, but I think often the case I see people will go, I've got this really weird result, right? Let's have a look at it. We go through, we do some assumptions checking and we go, okay, well, that's why. It's because your residuals are super skewed. No wonder it makes no sense. Or we might do some testing and we go, oh, look, you've got clear evidence of heterogeneity in your data set. Okay. So sometimes it could be, you know, make your, your analysis invalid, but sometimes it can explain some really strange results that you don't really know what's going on. And there are often multiple assumptions for models to consider. So a common one is the constant variance, um, homogeneity, a variance assumption, or also called the homoscedasticity assumption when we're talking about models. Independence between observations is a very, very common assumption that we make and often overlooked. But that's when we talk about, you know, does your data have repeated measures? If it doesn't have repeated measures, you know, then we might be able to assume independence provided that it's different people because we expect different people's observations not to affect each other's. But if it's the repeated measures, then they're, they're, they're no longer independent because it's based on the same person, all right? Um, it could be, it could be uh, sufficient sample size. Some uh, statistical methods, think chi-squared statistic, requires enough data for uh, us to get an approximation that works and we call them asymptotic methods. So there could be a sample size assumption that we need. There could be a, an assumption on how two things are related, like a linearity assumption that, you know, the relationship between these y's and x's form approximately a line when I was to put them on a scatter plot. That's a linearity assumption. 
um, or no multicollinearity, which essentially means we're not dealing with multiples of each other or, or functions of another. A common one, of course, everyone tends to know this one, the normality of the data or residuals. Everyone is always obsessed with normality of the data, and it's an important assumption. That's not the only assumption. All the assumptions need to be checked. And just another note with the normality assumption, because I think people are pretty good, well versed on knowing that this has a normality assumption. Um, it's not always that you need your data to be normally distributed. Sometimes we need, say, our residuals to be normally distributed or some other aspect of the data to be normally distributed. And so forcing everything to be normally distributed might shut you out from doing analyses that you could actually apply. So some analyses like t-tests, ANOVAs, Pearson correlations, they do require the data to be normally distributed. But if I was to do something like a, a linear regression, I actually only need the residuals to be normally distributed. I don't need my y's and x's to be normally distributed. Of course, if they are, then my normal my residuals probably end up looking normally distributed, but I don't need them to be. Sometimes the relationship between y and x corrects that skew and you end up with something in the residuals that look quite normally distributed. ARIMA modeling is a time series thing. Um, some analyses do not have parametric assumptions, but they do have other assumptions. We kind of already mentioned that. So these are kind of non-parametric tests. They will, all of these tests require independence between observations. Um, some of them require symmetric distributions. You know, so it, it's an important thing to, to consider. All right, my last point before I hand over to Marika is not adjusting for false positive bias. Okay. Um, and this could be the multiple comparisons issue or the, the p-value correction issue. A lot of people um, think about this. And essentially the logic of the false positive bias, remember this plot? Remember this plot and we said that 5% um, of the time a true null hypothesis will be rejected, right? Because we said it still could happen if the null hypothesis is true. It still could fall out in this extreme. It just happens with less than a 5% chance or five, at least 5% chance. Well, if it does, if it wasn't actually an extreme value, that's what we call a false positive, right? We rejected it when it actually was true. Okay, but that's only a 5% chance. It's a pretty small chance. We're gonna say, oh, I can deal with 5%. 95% of the time I should be okay. We shouldn't get a false positive. What if I did 12 tests, right? What if I did 12 tests? 5% chance there, 5% chance there, 5% chance there, 5% chance there, 12 tests. Not unusual for us to do multiple tests in a paper. Well then overall, assuming independence and not always the case, I've got a 46% chance of at least one true null hypothesis will be rejected by random chance. It's a lot higher than 5%. It's only half as likely that at least one of those is gonna be wrong. So we need to do something about it. Here's another example. This is generated data from me. So I know exactly that there is no trends here. There is no difference between gender. There is no difference between age groups. But if I was to run an, an ANOVA, the ANOVA tells me there's no significant differences, that's fine. But if I did all these post hoc tests, which basically I, I check for every combination of age group and, and gender, uh, whether or not there's a significant difference between another combination of age group and gender. This is just randomly sampled data. Three times I got a significant result. All right. I think there's 28 tests there. So three times I got a significant result. That's actually more than 5%. It's right? actually more than 5%. Um, if, you, if I had have generated another sample, it might have none. It might have one. It might have two. But just in this case, it was three. All right. So how do we address it? Well, the first thing we can do is we can limit our testing only to what we call planned analyses. These are things that you set out to from the start test. We restrict our analysis to only testing those which are important hypotheses. And Marika will talk about in a second, p-hacking, which is when we don't do that, right? Um, we can perform a p-value correction, uh, particularly when we're performing multiple comparisons. Uh, we should ensure interpretations acknowledge the inflated false positive risk. If we're talking about our results and saying, look, we did 100 tests and got two significant results, maybe there isn't, maybe that's not as significant as what you think. Right? And I think the other thing that's important here is that significance isn't everything. 
We should use multiple statistics to describe our results. We should use effect sizes. We should use p-values in and of themselves. You know, what is really the difference between a p-value of 0 0.051 and a p-value of 0 0.049? If I just talk about significance, I would say that those two results are very, very different. But if I actually give the p-value, you can say, oh, there is an actually much difference between those two things. It's only a couple of points in it. And confidence intervals are another useful tool in order to really kind of describe our results. So think about statistics as a holistic picture. Don't just think about it, is it significant or not? It's not everything. Right. Okay, so what if we actually corrected, just to take it back to that thing? If I did, this is what's called a one for only correction. It's essentially dividing our significance level by the number of tests. So instead of using a 5% significance level, we're gonna use a 0.4% significance level. We apply it to all 12 out of 10, so what does that do? It means we've got a 4.6% chance at least one of these null hypotheses will be rejected by random chance. Again, assuming independence. All right, now Bonferroni is quite a conservative thing. We only need it to be 5%. It takes it a little bit further down. Um, that's why there's other types of corrections you might see, Chiki's HSD, all those kinds of things. Some of them do that train up a little bit better. All right, and if we were to revisit our multiple comparisons from the before, but this time use our p-value corrected, this is co uh, corrected with uh, a Chuki's correction. You can see what happens to my p-values. Well, they're all basically a one, and the three that we had before, they become not significant. And that coincides with what we would expect even I generated this data to not be dependent. All right, cool, I'll hand over to Marika. Okay, so our next common mistake is p-hacking. Well, this one isn't a mistake actually because it's quite intentional. So what is p-hacking? So basically it's searching for significant results. So you're either collecting data, selecting data, or analyzing data until you get a statistically significant result. Now, the, the term itself was first coined back, I think, in about 2010, and it came out of the reproducibility crisis. So for those of you who have heard of that, it's um, a lot of papers were done back in that time demonstrating that if you repeated an experiment that was statistically significant, you got a result that wasn't statistically significant. And when those investigators started to question why that was happening, p-hacking is one of the reasons that they came up with. Um, also, these days where it's a published or perished culture, obviously you want your data to show something that's significant because it's easier then to get it published. So how do we actually know <laughs> Now, this is a really brilliant paper that was um, published in an exercise science journal, a very prominent one. And it was actually a study that looked at, let me just check the exact number here of um, papers that they looked at. So they looked at 48,390 articles that were published in 18 sports and exercise medicine journals over 20 years. And this graph shows the p-values, well, they're converted to z-values, so let me explain that, that were published in those papers. So the dark blue results are where the results were not significant. So that's the count of papers where the paper was published with a non-significant main result. The light blue ones are the papers that were published where there was a statistically significant result. So if you remember when Brad showed you that um, the distribution of the Z statistics or p-values, anything that's above 0.196 or below minus 0.196 is statistically significant here. And you can see that there's a real bias in these publications. As soon as the results become statistically significant, there's a much higher count of papers that are published. And what's really interesting is the number of papers that are published with a result that's only just statistically significant. So it's just gone below that 0 0.05 line. So that indicates that people have done something to make that result just cross that line so it can get published. So we, we don't actually know what the distribution should look like 
but we definitely know that it shouldn't look like this because this is clearly showing that the number of papers that are not statistically significant are being published more than the ones that are, are being published less often than the ones that are statistically significant. So how do you do it? And this is not a how-to guide. This is a what you shouldn't do guide. <clears throat> so it results from research and degrees of freedom. Now, Brad's just explained statistical degrees of freedom but what people mean by research and degrees of freedom is that when you do an analysis, you're making decisions about how to do it right from the very beginning. When you um, look at your data to start with, how you manage outliers, how you code it, everything you do is a decision you're making. There are some rules, but there are a lot of gray, er gray areas and you're making decisions along the way about how you treat that data. So common p-hacking methods include you keep collecting data until your p-value gets less than 0 0.05. 0 .05. So you start by looking at 20 participants and your results not statistically significant. So you say, oh, I'll just collect data on another 10. And then it's still not statistically significant. So you get another 10 and then it becomes statistically significant. So you're collecting the data until you get a significant value. Another common thing is to analyze many variables. So for example, selecting a choice of dependent variables, say you're assessing quality of life. Well, there are a number of different questionnaires to assess quality of life. So rather than just using one questionnaire to assess quality of life, you use 10 questionnaires to assess quality of life, 10 different questionnaires, and then you, you analyze the results of all 10 and pick the one that's statistically significant. And you can do a similar thing with selecting the choice of independent variables in your analysis. So you can have covariates like age and gender and other independent variables like treatment groups, for example. You might have a control group and you might have three treatment groups, but you might only analyze the results for two of the treatment groups. And that way you might get statistical significance. And that relates to the next point where you're collecting and analysing data on many groups, but you only report the ones that are statistically significant. And following on from that, you can use different covariates in your analysis and only consider the covariates that push your p-value below that critical value. You can also exclude observations or outliers, and there are a number of different procedures to justify that. So you can possibly find... A, a method that suits your purposes. So are you using two standard deviations, 2.5 standard deviations, three standard deviations? You can probably find a paper to justify it if you need to get rid of it to make your results significant. The same with data transformations. Now you can log transform, square root transform, take the inverse, use a box cox transformation. There are many different transformations and you should be justifying why you're doing those and not just using one which pushes your results over the line. You can also redefine scales. Now, this is really popular, particularly in packages like SPSS, where you can automatically um, put in a scale and see use the item deletion method to see if taking a particular item out of the scale actually improves the performance of that scale. So that can be a way as well to get rid of an item in a questionnaire that's not suiting the hypothesis or not suiting the results that you have. Also, you can discretize variables. So say you have a, um, a continuous variable and you want to divide it into two groups or three groups. So for some continuous variables, say BMI is a good example that Brad used before, there are actually defined categorical groupings for that variable. So you could easily justify using those categories of BMI. But for other variables, there might just be a continuous variable, say for example, age, and you could discretize that or divide it into groups on how it suits your analysis rather than on any actual um, defined reason for doing it. You can also use a number of different hypothesis tests. So for example, if you've got two independent groups, you could use a T-test or you could use a Welch test or you could use a Mann-Whitney test. And they, might, they, they will all definitely give you different p-values and you might have one that gives you a non-significant result and one that gives you a significant result. 
These days also there's a lot of attention paid rightly to missing data. And there are a number of different ways that you can impute missing data. So you can use methods like substituting the mean or the median or last observation carried forward or baseline observation carried forward, which are all not ideal. But even when you use uh, proper um, statistical methods like multiple imputation, there are a number of different decisions that you have to make in doing multiple imputation. It's not just a standard technique. And they, those imputations can give you very different results in the analysis. There's also incorrect rounding of p-values. Now, you really wouldn't think this happens, but it's very easy to pick up because as, Fred, as Brad mentioned when he went through the example of the t-statistic, each p-value has an actual test statistic value associated with it. And what people have found when they've looked at papers is that people are actually rounding down a p-value to make it less than 0.05. And then they're giving the actual value of the test statistic. And when you look it up, it's actually 0.051 or something like that. So that's actually incorrect reporting of data. And that does happen as well. And usually people just don't do one of these. They keep doing them until they get the result that they want. So this is a real example that was an actual experiment, but it was conducted um, back in 2011. But this is a really nice one because it gives you a result and then it actually tells you what they actually did. So what they reported in the paper was that they got 20 University of Pennsylvania undergraduates to listen to When I'm 64, which you probably all heard, or this other song, which I'd never heard of, but it's called Kalimbala and it used to be the background music on Windows 7, and it sounds like this. I'm not sure if anyone's heard that. But either you got to listen to a bit of the Beatles or you got to listen to that. And then they asked their date of birth and their father's age, and they adjusted for father's age in an ANCOBA. And they proved statistically that those who listened to when I'm 64 were younger than those who listened to Quimbla. And that was statistically significant. And that's how they reported in the paper. But what they really did is written here. So in bold is what they reported and in gray is what they actually did. So they reported that they analyzed data on 20 subjects, but they actually had 34. There were three groups because one group listened to hot potato by the wiggles, but it didn't give a statistically significant result. So they added the participants as they went along and they also collected information on a lot more variables than the ones they reported. And the one that they were actually interested in was the one about how old they felt, but that didn't show statistical significance. So um, you can see that they did collect a lot of variables, but they only used father's age to control for variation. And also, um, if they didn't control for father's age, the results weren't statistically significant. So that's an example of p-hacking that actually happened, even though it's a bit of a nonsense um, experiment, but it does demonstrate what happens. And here's another study that looked at what happens to the, um, the false positive rate as you do a number of these, because as I mentioned, people don't just generally do one of these. They keep doing them until they get the result that they want. So for example, in this simulation, they started with the t-test. They did three different types of tests to, um, to look at independent groups. So I think they did the t-test, the Welch test, and the Whitney. They looked at five correlated dependent variables and picked the one that gave the best result. Then they looked at three correlated covariates and again picked the one that gave the best result. They restricted the sample based on three different binary grouping variables as well. And then the false positive rates gone up quite a bit. And similarly with regression, they used five different imputation methods. They used different transformations to the dependent and the independent variable. They manipulated the um, scale they were using by item deletion, and they also used different outlier removal strategies, and then they ended up getting significant results. So how to stop it? Just don't do it. Use your research degrees of freedom.
pre-register your protocol and all the analyses you're going to do and have a statistical analysis plan and publish your protocol paper before you collect the data. So, and also provide code for everything you've done so people can see and it's transparent. And a comment that a lot of people think that Bayesian analyses may overcome this and they're less prone to p-hacking, but there are also a lot of assumptions you're making there as well. So the next one is fairly quick. Yeah, good. Okay. So correlation versus causation. And hopefully this is something um, that you're all familiar with. So if we take a correlation, it's a coefficient, it's a number that we're measuring that goes from minus one through to one. And I'll show you what that means in a diagram in a sec. Now, when we're looking at correlation, we're looking at a linear relationship. And what it's suggesting is that as one variable increases, the other increases or decreases. It doesn't infer causation. So just because two variables correlate, it doesn't mean that one causes the other. So if you're doing correlations, you should always, well, if you're doing anything, you should always plot your data, but particularly for correlations, it's really important to always plot and visualize your data. So for example, here are some correlations um, between two different variables. And what you can see is what we're looking at are the linear correlations. So they're the first two rows there they're all data sets that it would be appropriate to do a correlation on. The bottom row shows relationships that are definitely there in the data and they should be modeled, but they're not linear relationships. So you shouldn't be using a correlation to look at those relationships. And you can see that they're all giving a zero correlation. So we need to use some other sort of method to model those. There's also the dinosaur data set, if any of you have seen this. So these data sets all give exactly the same statistics in terms of the means, the standard deviations and the correlations, but you can see that they're completely different data, data sets and they shouldn't all be um, examined using correlation. So often when we do correlations, there could be a lurking variable or a third variable that's causing the relationship. So in the first example here, we have A causing B and A causing C. So if A increases, then B and C increase together, but that does, and, and it appears that B causes an increase in C, but that's not what's happening. And also if A, causes B and B causes C, if you only measure A and C, it appears that A causes C. So time is a really common working third variable and there are lots of other ones as well. But to give you an example of the time issue, there's this brilliant website that was created by a very bored PhD student called Tyler Vigen and he's now very rich and famous. And he spent a lot of time during his PhD mining big data sets and looking for relationships. And one of my favourite ones here um, was looking at the relationship between cheese consumption and death by bedsheet entanglements. And you can see there that there's definitely a relationship between those two variables. But what's missing is the time factor. So over time, cheese consumption went up and also the number of reported um, entanglements, the death by entanglements in bed sheets also went up, probably just because of the increase in population in the US. So time is a confounding variable there. So cheese consumption also correlates with all of these other variables as well. And in none of these is there a causal relationship between those two particular variables. Another nice one that's more recent that he's done, of course, is looking at avocado toast consumption because that's now very popular and showing the relationship there with associate degrees awarded in science technologies. So a couple of other issues to look out for in correlation is when you have clusters in your data. And a really common reason that this happens is when you're grouping data, say, by countries. So this could be, the X variable could be the increase in cancer incidence and the Y variable could be the increase in income. Now, this data is reporting country 
country incidents within countries. And what's actually happening here is that the higher the income in a country, the more cancer they detect because they've got better health facilities and so they're looking for the cancer. And so the relationship is just an artefact of the fact that richer countries do more screening for cancer. And if you look at within a country, there's no relationship between income and the incidence of cancer. Outliers can also have a really profound effect on a relationship. So you can see here in the uh, graph in red that just adding a single point can make a non-significant correlation significant. So the only way that you can make causal inference is to actually do an experiment or have some kind of biological, physiological or environmental um, evidence that that relationship actually exists. And just to reiterate again, that you should always plot and visualize your data. So the next one's really quick, um, and it's just something that's becoming more prevalent as people move into machine learning and data mining because it's quite common there. So overfitting is when you are performing an analysis that's too close to the level of data. So if you're just going in and doing a lot of data mining or machine learning methods, you really need to keep an eye on this because you need to adjust the analysis to make sure that you are fitting the model properly. So doing a well-fitting model instead of an underfitting model or an overfitting model. The reason for doing this is because if you've overfit your model, when you go to use that model on data that wasn't the data you collected on, it won't respond very well to the new data. So essentially what it means is your results won't be generalizable. And when you collect a sample of data, what you're hoping is that your results can be extrapolated to another data set. And if you're overfitting your model, then that won't be the case. It also can come up um, in multiple regression, which is something that commonly people do do by having too many variables in the model. And as I said, it's becoming very common in machine learning particularly when you're looking at nonlinear modeling, um, as is being done here, it's very easy to get models that are overfitting the data if you're not um, looking out for it. Okay, so the last point I'm going to cover before I hand back to Brad is overstating results. So this is about spin and type two error, which is something that Brad's already referred to. So we'll be coming back to that. So spin is when you have a non-significant result. Often it's a borderline non-significant result, but you're trying to sell that result um, as being important. It's really common in many disciplines. There've been lots of systematic reviews and meta-analyses done, and I'm sure you'll be able to find one in your discipline because it's very um, common to be doing those. And there are also umbrella meta-analyses being done on this as well. So some um, phrases that might be used are things like particularly large or I can't see my slide there. Um, but anyway, so there have been a lot of studies done on this and looking at some of the most common phrases that are used in terms of suggesting those. So you can see that in a, a study looking at 567 thousand RCTs, they found the most common phrases there were things like marginally significant, all but significant, non-significant trend, failed to reach statistical significance. And here, if you want to see how those terms you look in a sentence, here are two sentences here where they use those. And so that's how they're overstating the results in that particular context. So this is actually a paper that's making recommendations about how you can identify these and what you should do about them. Um, it's kind of a checklist, so it's quite a useful reference to look at as well. So where are these results reported? Often it can be in the title or it can be in the results or it can be in the conclusions. But the important thing to note here is that in this in this analysis, 
around 23% of them actually made claims about those results, even though the results weren't statistically significant. So that's when it really becomes a problem is when you're actually drawing conclusions about results that are not significant at all. So um, a group of investigators that do a lot of work in this field actually did a randomized controlled trial to look at the effect of spin in a, in a report. And what they did was they got um, 297 health students and, profession and professionals to rate four different abstracts based on these um, fictional drugs. One was called Naranex, and it was whether it was better than another drug called Bulletville. So what they did here is that they had four scenarios. So the first one here had a statistic, a, a, a non-significant result and no spin. And what they got them to do was rate on a Likert scale from one to seven, where if one, they didn't believe that Naranex was better than Bulletville and seven was where they did believe it was. So when there was no statistically significant result and no spin, they didn't believe that Naranex was better than Bulletville. But if you start to put in a bit of spin, so you've still got the non-statistically significant result here of 0 0.06, but what you've done is you've reported a secondary analysis that was statistically significant, and you've also done a subgroup analysis that was statistically significant. So your actual primary hypothesis wasn't, but you've done a bit of spin here in reporting some other variables that were significant. And once you've done that, then the Likert scale reading goes up to six. So people are starting to believe that Naranex is better than Bulletville, even though your primary result is not statistically significant. So when the primary result was statistically significant, they believed that it was better than that the Naranex was better than the Bulletville, regardless of spin. So the spin is really only having an effect on the belief about the outcome when the results are not statistically significant. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to say there's no statistically significant result. And if that's your primary hypothesis, then going on to spin your study by looking at other secondary analyses is misleading if you're using that to provide evidence that your primary hypothesis was significant. Okay, so getting back as well to what Brad said um, at, when he was talking about um, the theory behind this, just because there's no statistically significant difference doesn't mean that they're different, that they're not different or that they're equivalent. So if you've got a p-value that's less than 0 0.05, it's saying there's an absence of evidence of difference. Now, there's a very good paper, an old one written by Bland and Altman, who many of you would have heard of for a different reason, um, looking at this um, consideration. If you do want to show that two treatment groups are the same, then you actually need to use a completely different paradigm of statistical testing called equivalence testing. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it other than to mention it and to say that when you do an equivalence test, you have to set up your hypothesis test in a completely different way. And before you do the test, you have to make a decision about what bounds you consider to be statistically equivalent. And then you go on and actually use a procedure called a two one-sided test to test that it's statistically um, equivalent. Or you can use a confidence interval to say, a, before you conduct the study, you set the two bounds, which are these two dotted lines here, and if your confidence interval falls completely within those bounds, then you could say it's equivalent. So as I said, I'm, this is all a bit confusing because there are terms here that you may not be familiar with. But what it's in, important to note from this is that you can't just say things are equivalent unless you've formally gone through a procedure of testing or equivalence. And that's a different method to what you've traditionally using when you're using the methods that you've learned about. 
Okay, so back to Brad. All right, our last point. I'll try and make it really quick. Um, okay, so one of the big problems we have when we're doing studies is what we call sample bias. And this is something that every person who does statistics has to encounter, right? No sample is perfect. I wish they were, but they are. So um, I'm going to ask the question, what makes data representative, right? I want to make, say, take this sample and say it represents a broader population. What makes it representative? And I've got a, a, a good little example here, thought experiment. We think statisticians are cool. Well, if you ask 100 statisticians, they probably think we're quite cool. Right? And I think I'm quite cool. Um, but if you ask the general public, probably not. Right? <laughs> um, I think the important point here is asking more statisticians won't make me what would give me a more representative sample. It makes a difference who it is you ask and how you selected them. So answer, it's about who you ask, how we select them, or in other words, it's about sampling design. Right? Um, and we talk about sampling design quite a lot. Usually if you come and see me at the start of your project, we'll have quite a long discussion about your sample and how you're going to collect it and what are the, what are the potential sources of bias that could arise. So how do we obtain a representative sample? We usually fall into kind of two classes. Either we select the sample, and that means we start off with a list of every single person we could possibly select, and we use some kind of probability map. So that could be, we say, okay, let's just select 100 random people, and we will go and ask them and get a sample. Now that sounds all good in a nice, perfect world, but we can't force people to participate in our surveys. In fact, it's usually unethical to coerce people to participate in our samples. And so even our kind of, this is what we call a probability sample, suffer from a thing called non-response bias. There are other methods, not just randomly selected, but do systematic sampling, which is where we take every, say, every second school or every third school and then, uh, you know, sample the administrators there. We could do stratified sampling where we separate things into various regions or groups first or strata we use the term first, and then we sample each of those strata independently. Um, or we can do cluster sampling where we go and we say, we're going to measure everyone in that particular household and then select households and then adjust for the fact that people in the same household are probably more similar. Problem with probability samples are they are very, usually very expensive. They're usually very time consuming. No one really has the data. Nobody really has a perfect list with everyone's details in it, except maybe if you're the ABS or the tax office. Um, and we still have that issue of non-response bias. So a lot of people end up falling into this cap, which is the sample selects us. Um, we usually advertise to a whole heap of people and we hope that they want to participate. And that's what we usually get out of online polls or what we generally broadly call convenience sampling. Now, the important thing to consider when doing this is who will see our advertisement and who will agree to be part of the survey. And whenever you're doing something like this, where we're not keeping track of non-response and we're not keeping track of all those kind of important metrics, is this voluntary response bias. And that's especially true when we're talking about kind of really emotive issues or really passionate issues. People who say have been a victim of crime are much more likely to participate in a survey about crime than someone who hasn't, because it means something a lot to them. Um, we, you know, coming from the data privacy world, we always say you don't care about your privacy until it's been violated. It's the same kind of principle here. People who care about an issue are more likely to participate in research about that issue, and that can lead to quite extreme results. And it's something we need to consider. Uh, the problem with this is that there is no real way, no kind of probability way of measuring the level of bias in our sample. Think about this. This came after the, the first Kamala, well, there's one Kamala Harris Donald Trump debate. Newsmax, which is a conservative media outfit, asked, who do you think won the debate? And 93% of people said Donald Trump. All right. Now, how many Democrats do you think watch Newsmax? Probably not a lot. How many people who like Kamala Harris watch Newsmax? Probably not a lot. And okay. this is an example of sample bias. Okay, so... What do, we, what do we do when we, what do we need to think about when we're trying to account for sample bias? You always start out with your target population. This is the thing, I, I've been saying population quite a lot. It's the, 
it's the group or the, the broad spectrum of people who I want to make inference about. Who do I want to learn? Who do I want to study? It could be everyone in the world. It could be, you know, every um, person in Australia. It could be everyone in the uni. You know, it, you can have different levels of population. Um, you just need to be very clear about that. You think, what exactly is my target population? Then you're going to think about, well, who can I feasibly get, right? What's my sampling frame? Who are the people who I could reasonably recruit? And if there's a big mismatch between these, that's going to give you more non-response non bias or, or non-sampled bias. Um, say if you're using social media, you're going to get rid of everyone who doesn't have social media, right? Does that, does, do those people have an inherent uh, opinion or bias or association? Maybe, we don't know. It might not be a problem, it might be a problem, but we have no real way of testing. And then within that, you will have, you know, some set of exclusion criteria that you don't actually want because you might get people you don't want. You know, you might only want adults and you get a few 17-year-olds join the survey, so you have to get rid of them. And you're left with whatever's the middle. That's your sim. Okay, so things to keep in mind. Were any people less likely to be recruited or more likely to be recruited? Again, if it's volunteer bias, we have to think about, well, what potentially, uh, what sources of bias could be there. If, if it's volunteer bias, are these people, say if they uh, care about the environment and I'm doing a study on you know, what actions people take in order to um, you know, limit their carbon emissions, um, it might mean that you get an inflated result of everyone seems to be doing a lot because only people who would actually care and care about climate change are going to respond. Be careful when making generalizations, all right? Um, don't instantly say, okay, I've got this sample, therefore I know exactly what's going on with the population. You know, discuss your limitations, be transparent, acknowledge sources of bias. Um, don't just assume you've got a representative sample. Always kind of consider these things in a lot of detail. More data does not necessarily mean more representative. Just because I have a truckload of observations does not mean it's representative, all right? Unless, of course, you ask everyone. Once you ask everyone, you're fine. So if you want to increase your sample size to improve representativity, it's fine with me, as long as you get every single person to respond. Um, waiting does not necessarily fix all problems. A lot of people think, I, I, I see this all the time, um, on media, usually it's not a statistician, it's usually some kind of researcher says, my study's really great, even though it's this, you know, online poll and I've asked 10,000 people, we've weighted it, so we've fixed all the problems that are. Well, weighting doesn't account for volunteer bias. It only means that if I've got a discrepancy with whatever demographic characteristics, uh, you know, differ in my sample compared to the broader population, we can correct on that, but that doesn't mean that, you know, um, the, the specific young people that I get care the same about the young people I don't get, right? It doesn't, it doesn't address that. So it doesn't fix all the problems. It can help, particularly if we're interested in, say, making things geographically representative or making things uh, uh, you know, representative from the male's and female's perspective, but it doesn't solve all of our problems. And sometimes it can make it worse. More non-response means more opportunity for bias. Okay, so if you've got a sample and you've got 80% response rate, that's a great sample. If you've got a sample and you've got a 0.5% response rate, not so great a sample, all right? We can use response rates as a measure to kind of self-satisfy ourselves. Now, I've heard stories of election polling in America where people have like a 0.5% response rate. Um, so it can be quite fluctuating. Uh, there could be quite a lot of variability. Yep, emotive issues are more susceptible. We kind of already uh, talked about that. This is an important point, which a lot of people don't, don't realize. Margins of errors, and statistical testing, and all that kind of thing does not in any way account for sample bias. That's assuming it's a perfect sample. So if I say a 5% margin of error, that's not saying there's a 5% chance of missampled people. That's how much variation I could expect from a perfect sample. Okay, so margins of error, you could probably, you know, add a lot more of a, of a, a skeptical uh, gaze on that. It's not guaranteed that your result's gonna be within the margin of error if my sampling design isn't good. Um, one thing you can do is you can check demographics with benchmarks. Um, you know, you can look at your descriptive table, say, does this look what I would expect uh, a, a representative sample to look like? 
and you can compare that with benchmarks. That's one way to try and make an argument about this. All right, final comments. Thank you. All right. Um, just one really quick one is to make sure you check your work. So make sure there are, there are so many figures and tables that get published with mistakes in them. Don't do it. Have a look at it. Get someone to read it. Get someone to read it clean. And I just love this point here where the term statically significant has actually been reported a number of different times, over a thousand times in journals. So actually still check your work, look at it. And most importantly, keep your code. Even SPSS now in its workbook mode lets you keep all of the syntax of all the analyses you do. Keep it, use it, publish it. We also have a data science community of practice. Um, you can probably get in touch with uh, uh, when I release the slides, you can uh, access the link to that. Also, you can contact us through the Statistical Consulting Centre if you just go into the UIW website and search for Statistical Consulting Centre, you'll get our link. Okay, and we will, um, we will publish this talk and the slides on our website. And um, also, if you specifically want that link or the slides, you can email us. We can both be found on the Drake Street. Okay, so thanks. Thank you. Um, any questions from yeah. anyone here or online? Yeah, so we, yeah, were there any questions? <laughs> we don't have a lot of time. I have a pretty strange and broadly distributed. So, what is the 5%? Because we mentioned them many yeah. times. Yeah, why do they 